Hello, hi. I am so uh, I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you so much for being here, uh, Don and Rigby. To our alumni speakers on behalf of Pacific Lutheran University, I am so glad you're here. My name is Rosario. I am a transgender man, a student leader here at PLU, and I work as an advocate in the Diversity Center. I use he, him pronouns, and I am honored to be introducing Don and Rigby Alger, who have been pioneers in supporting and advocating for queer students who go to PLU. Their continued impact includes the Alger Scholar Award, which has given students the opportunity to create positive change on campus. I would like to give a few statements about myself and the land we are on. I want to recognize we are on the traditional territory of the Nisqually, Puyallup, Squaxin Island, and Stilicum people. The Diversity Center starts out every program with the statement because it should be the first thing people hear from our mouths. As I am a settler to this land, it is of the utmost importance that I recognize I am on stolen land. Therefore, all the work I engage in also works towards that goal, giving the land back to the local tribes who continue to be leaders in our community today. I would like to preface this story by saying my experience does not reflect the experiences of all trans people, and I have had significant privileges and support along my journey. When I realized I was trans, my entire life experience made sense. And it was so laughably easy compared to the confusion I had experienced my entire life. Something fundamentally different now had an explanation. It was clarity, truth to my very core. And now that I gained that clarity, I could never again live in ignorance. Now I would like to introduce our wonderful speakers. Don Alger is currently a per diem RN at Peace Island Medical Center on San Juan Island, working in oncology, PACU, and OR. She moved to San Juan Island to help create the cancer center at this critical access hospital that opened in November of 2012. In 2014, Don won the prestigious Peace Health Spirit of Healing Caregiver Award for collaboration as the program coordinator in cancer support for Peace Health's Northwest Network. Dawn is a 1995 graduate from PLU's School of Nursing and has continued to be active as an alumni, serving on the Nursing Alumni Association Board, Gender Diversity Board, and guest speaker in advocating for gender diverse patients. Dawn's family inspires her to advocacy. I have been lucky enough to have received care from nurses who are informed in transgender healthcare, and I am very grateful for Dawn's continued impact in the field. Rigby Alger is currently working on his master's degree in art education at the Art of Education Inst University in Iowa. He received his BA in special education K through 12 from PLU School of Education in 2019. The welcoming and supportive environment at PLU inspired him to give back to the university through continued LGBTQ plus advocacy. I also want to say thank you to my stepmom, Chris, and my dad, Lori, for watching here today. My family and my chosen family kept me safe and affirmed me while I got the medical care I needed during my transition. All of my relationships with family are complex and continue to be complex. There's an opportunity to find the gratitude in the growth in all of us. I am so excited to hear the story of another mother and son who navigated the same process my mom and I did. I am so privileged and honored to be introducing Don and Rigby. Thank you so much for speaking here today. Thank you. Thank you, Rosario. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, we'll go ahead and share our screen for our presentation here. And hopefully that comes up. All right. And um, let's go ahead and go to the next screen there. Um, so as Rosario said, I'm a 1995 graduate of Pacific Lutheran University, had received such a wonderful education there. Um, but uh, I think our diversity in education that we had received in nursing school at my time in the early 90s, um, I think the most diverse thing that we had addressed was maybe if you had a Buddhist as a patient, can they bring their own rice? I mean, there really was no diversity uh, as far as 
anything in regards to LGBTQ. And I'm just so proud of the system now with Dr. Uh, Barbara Haberman, who has kind of shelved our old curriculum and is incorporating LGBTQ studies into almost every semester now of nursing school, because we have such a diverse population, we need to have our healthcare reflect those diversities in our population. Um, so it's very exciting to see where this current school of nursing is going. And um, um, I know when Rigby was a student, if you'd like to talk about your LGBTQ acceptance there in um, 2015. And yeah. Um, no, PLU was a very welcoming environment. Um, it was one of the first places where a teacher actually addressed um, in you know her first class we had these little cards saying getting to know you and it said what are your preferred pronouns and i think that was the first time i was ever asked that and being um a transgender man i felt seen for once and that i could actually put my pronouns um pre-surgery and actually have teachers addressing me by the name that i was uh switching to and as well as my pronouns yeah, and we'll go ahead on to the next. Okay, we don't have uh, anything to disclose, uh, no conflicts of interest. Uh, we just wanna say we're not experts. This is our basic family story. Um, we had also uh, initially wanted to include my older son uh, who is homosexual. However, he works for the State Department in the Foreign Service and he is currently stationed in Ulaanbaatar at the US Embassy and it's four in the morning there and it's a work day for him. So unfortunately we weren't able to, we aren't able to share the full elder family and and then I have another busy son um, in Portland area and it's his work week as well so you've got Rigby and I here today and uh, as I said we're just uh, sharing our personal experience and ours is not necessarily the norm mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of good family support but as uh, Rosario had introduced and um, told us uh, there are a lot of complex relationships, um, and we do it in our families as well. Um, our goals for this presentation, Rigby? Um, mine is to help uh, provide perspective on healthcare from a, you know, a trans man as well as my family, um, in the hopes to encourage greater healing and awareness to the transgender community. And a lot of the, uh, I guess visions of transgender can be quite varied that you see today. And we just want to pro provide kind of our perspective and um, really help educate that uh, people so that they can see we're, we're normal, um, we want to share our experiences, what was good, what was bad, um, and just kind of talk about how we were impacted and how maybe those experiences uh, can increase empathy and contribute um, to better under understanding and help with the healing process because healing is uh, possible and sometimes it takes some time and some patience and we all can use a little bit more in the patience department but um, we just want to help get the word out and have people ask questions of us so that we can help clarify and maybe share a little bit of what we've been through and, and our um, path. Uh, in order to kind of talk about um, where we are now, you need to know where we've been. Um, and in my biography, I say I won the gender <laughs> lottery because I have three sons. I, um, one of each. One of each. <laughs> I have in the larger picture with airline pilot, that is my husband, Mark. Uh, he's now retired from Alaska Airlines. Um, on his right side, the taller of the two is my middle son, Tyson. Um, and then Rigby's down there with the black PLU jacket on. And then on Mark's other uh, side is Zach, our oldest. He is a PLU grad as well. Um, 
couple of years earlier, this was a family picture uh, with all of us in our interests. So my husband used to be a professional squash player and he is a pilot. I work in the medical field and played squash as well. Zach, that was when he was going to PLU um, and was the world traveler and is now currently a big world traveler. Um, and Rigby, uh, before we knew everything was going on, um, but you can see a little bit of the gender dysphoria there with baggy pants, baggy shirt, but the art was huge in uh, Rigby's life. And then my son Tyson, who's, you know, super jock, captain of the hockey team, captain of the baseball team. And uh, so those are kind of two, one a few years past and one a little bit more recent. Uh, Mark retired in 2020 and that was his final flight with Alaska Airlines. So I kind of want to tell you a little bit about our family to, to see where we go from here. Um, as my husband would like to tell people, he goes, yes, I have three sons. I have a homosexual son, a heterosexual son, and a transgender son. And uh, the son who went into journalism, we're still having a little hard time adjusting to and, and figuring that out. How did that happen? <laughs> um, and that's our middle son, the hockey uh, captain there. And usually people get quite a kick out of that because it's like <laughs> journalism, a dying art form. But um, yeah, we, we have kind of used a lot of humor to adjust to our family life. Um, I grew up in a very uh, conservative household. I'm a path Lutheran church uh, minister's pastor's daughter, and so had an extremely conservative upbringing. Uh, life was about the church. Uh, I served as youth group leaders, as Sunday school teachers, on the board of education, women's Bible study. Um, basically, our life was surrounding the church. Um, my husband and I married a little over 38 years ago. Um, and we had our first son, Zach, then came along our next son, Tyson. And uh, then I decided at that time, I kind of wanted to go back to school. Initially, I went into business and I decided I really wanted to go into nursing. Um, so I registered at Pacific Lutheran University. We were living in Enumclaw at the time and then found out I was pregnant. And I said, no, I'm going to do this anyway. And um, was pretty excited because it was a girl. And so I thought, okay, great, change of pace. And um, proceeded to uh, Go back to school with a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and had Rigby in between semesters from winter to spring. Don't recommend that. <laughs> That's uh, much better to go when you don't have children present, <laughs> but um, it all worked out well. So Rigby actually um, First started in uh... utero, <laughs> and then I showed up. Uh, I was induced a week early. Um showed up with him the very next week at spring semester start. I had professors that would sneak into my lecture classes and take him away and I would have to find him later on. So um, he early on had an affinity for the science building <laughs> at PLU. Um, and uh, so it just kind of made sense that eventually he graduated from PLU as well. Um, when Rigby was little, um, that was probably the, the picture with the three of them there and Rigby in a dress. Um, that was probably the last time I could get Rigby in a dress because early, early on, um, we used the term tomboy because we, you know, I didn't have transgender in my vocabulary, um, but he would insist that I'm not a girl, I'm a boy and I don't want to wear a dress. So thus we have, you know, boots and pants and, and all his friends, he identified with boys. He wanted to play with cars. He wanted to play with Legos. He didn't want pink. It was excruciating to have uh, the neighbor girl over who was a year younger because she wanted to do girl things. And Rigby was like, no. And so from early on, from actually preschool, probably three years old, on, he just insisted that, no, I'm a boy. 
um, my parents would always go, young lady, come over here. And Rigby would adamantly state, I'm not a long lady. You know, I'm a boy. And um, that's where probably the first tensions began with my parents because they were very adamant that, okay, you finally have a girl. Let's dress her up. We need to get her into dancing. We need to, and they were very um, pushing in that direction. And um, so I really had to take a stand against my parents, which was uncomfortable for me because thinking of honoring my mother and father, and yet it was more important to me to honor my child and support who they were. And um, art was very important. And it's like, you know what? My kid's a great kid. Um, as long as their clothes is clean, clothes are clean. I don't care what they wear. And um, but as you can see, uh, maybe Rigby, you can point out in yeah. that picture. <laughs> no, certainly, um, and definitely, I have those early mem memories growing up. I want to say the earliest I recall um, was my mom trying to get me my Sunday best and um, was trying to get me to wear a dress so I would look great for church. And I remember arguing her with her um, probably last time wearing a dress was I'm a boy, not a girl. And it was a bit of back and forth until it was no, okay, fine, we'll, we'll wait. Uh, you know, we'll make sure you have clean clothes and you look nice, but you are a girl. Um, but yeah, during childhood, I definitely was, um, all my friends were guys. I was hanging out with guys. I was one of the guys. Um, and I didn't really have a concept of necessarily gender identity back then, other than um, I was adamant that I was a boy. I didn't know why I was saying that or what it really meant to be a boy or a girl. Um, and so I kind of stored that in the back of my mind. You know, I didn't really, you don't really think about that in preschool. Um, what does it mean to be a boy or what does it mean to be a girl? Other than I knew that all my friends were boys and the boys got to do things that I wanted to do. Um, and so that was very frustrating for me growing up of, oh no, you're a girl, you need to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and I always had a lot of pushback on that of, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. And maybe I'm not a girl then, maybe I'm a boy. And um, <laughs> so a lot of my outfits were baggy clothes and um, you no, know, it was fun shirts that the guys would wear. I wanted to dress how my guy friends were dressing. So we talk about gen gender dysphoria, and that was definitely very apparent. And as you can see, the definition there, and it seemed like in a lot of the pictures, um, you know, here I had this child that was so different. And of course, being the third child, okay, my first one's super active. My second one's very loud, extremely active, and they were all involved in sports. And, and so there's a lot of activity in the household. Um, Rigby was used to having two older brothers. Um, and we would try to encourage playtime with uh, the neighbor girl, but that just wasn't something that um, Rigby enjoyed. And uh, his best friends were um, uh, Devin and, and Davis. Davis. And I mean, even through till at least middle school. And I mean, he'd have sleepovers with the guys and everybody thought that was so odd. And, and yet here is this incredible child that did not conform to what my idea or what our known ideas of what a little girl should be. And I adjusted because I could see how talented um, Rigby was and really appreciated him for who he was. But I just knew, okay, this is, I, I put away kind of those dreams of, all right, not going to play with dolls, not going to wear dresses, that's okay. Not going to go to the prom, you know. Um, I just kind of tucked those things away because I had a tomboy and that's kind of how I saw that. But you can definitely see in these. And then I believe the next slide um, going to preschool. This is three year, old, three year old preschool. And as you can see in the background, all the girls are princesses. So we have pink dresses and we have tiaras and crowns. And Rigby said, I want to be a bug. <laughs> And so <laughs> it's like, all right, we'll, we'll be a ladybug. But here's, you can see the difference. Um, 
he wasn't following the path of uh, all these other kiddos. And then I believe the next year you made your own dragon costume. So there was this, another sea of pink princesses. And, and I was a dragon. And Rigby was a dragon. And was like, okay, I'm cool. He totally made his outfit himself. And we were pretty proud about that. Um, and so... It, you know, you can see the differences there, especially as we look back and go, okay, that was always there. Um, as he got older, um, the gender dysphoria became just a little bit, you could see how uncomfortable he was becoming, and especially going through uh, puberty. Um, Rigby was di diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So we're looking at, you know, more facial hair, had a lot of pain with periods, um, was just so uncomfortable with breast development. And um, as he got older, just that pain of who he was became even more uh, pronounced. Um, he tended to hide in his room a lot and would be there with the drapes drawn, didn't want pictures taken. Um, when we travel, um, he just uh, was so uncomfortable in his own body. I mean, I think he was excited about travel, but I mean, you just see the pain in his eyes. When we look at uh, the birthday picture here, okay, we're not happy to have our picture taken. Uh, when we moved to the islands, we did get this wonderful role boxer bulldog named Otis. And let me tell you, that was such a great therapy dog for, for <laughs> Rigby at that time. And then this other picture is when we were in Spain, uh, Zach was studying abroad in Granada and, and we went to visit and, and had an absolutely fantastic time. But it's one where Rigby just wanted to hide. And that was constantly an issue for me of why, why does my child hurt so much? I just, I don't quite understand why are they so uncomfortable with who they are? And um, and at that time, Zach hadn't come out to us yet. And so, you know, we're still this family that's, you know, a, a fairly tight unit. But Zach was having his own issues with kind of pushing his brother and sister away. Um, and we didn't realize all the turmoil that he was going through. And he kept everyone at a distance because... He was worried about losing his family. Um, when he came out to us, um, it was with uh, uh, with other uh, these students or, or homosexual friends. The majority of them had been disowned by their families, so he was very afraid of losing his family. And he kept us at arm length distance until he came out. Um, and so, before we jump into Zach's story, which is intertwined with mine. Um, definitely going through middle school and high school is when I felt the most dysphoria. Um, again, LGBTQ was not part of our language. We were still very much um, a family that grew up with c very conservative Christian values in a conservative Christian state. Um, and so I remember in middle school, um, when puberty hit, that was probably the worst time of my life. Um, I remember such confusion and disappointment um, because when I was growing up, I went, well, I feel like a boy. My friends are boys. And I feel so strongly this way that when I hit puberty, my body's naturally going to be developing into a boy's body. And I didn't really have the language or words for that. None of this was um, ever taught to me. I didn't know what transgender was. And so uh, the discomfort of growing breasts was probably one of the hardest things to go through. I remember when um, every every day when I would take a shower from middle school on through high school, um, just being disgusted my, by my breasts to the fact that I would hide them from myself going into the shower so I wouldn't have to look at them. And um, it was, I was trying to find bras that made it as flat as possible, um, sports bras, just anything to give me the chest that I, you know, felt I was supposed to have because it, it's hard to describe how uncomfortable it is to have something on your body that's natural, but to feel like it's so unnatural and wrong. Um, it was frustrating. And so a lot of my clothing tended to help me feel comfortable. And so it was very baggy clothes. So you couldn't see that I had breasts um, and baggy pants as well. Um, 
And my mom was picking up on that. Um, I don't know uh, at that point if she was seeing that as gender dysphoria necessarily. I think it was more, I was having some sort of problem with my body, but she didn't, she didn't know what and couldn't put her finger on it. And I didn't have the language or knowledge at the time to articulate what was uncomfortable about my body. Um, with the polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, one of the side effects of that is a higher testosterone, um, which means I was actually growing facial hair, which I felt was right, but I was so confused to have breasts and facial hair. It was um, it was hard. I, I definitely got bullied at school for that. Um, when I, at that time, was identifying as a lesbian, uh, my girlfriends were always disgusted that I had facial hair because they're like, oh, that makes you look like a guy. So I had to constantly shave that off. And I would have questions with them of, would you still love me if I was a guy? Um, and their answer was always no. Um, and so that you know, compounded my confusion because it's like, okay, well, why, why do I want to be a guy? Um, and why does facial hair feel right and breasts feel wrong? Um, and a lot of that came to a head, um, of course, when Zach uh, came out. And so you can share uh, his story of coming out because then it later led to me coming out as well. Yeah. So Zach was our, uh, he came out to us while he was at PLU. And of course, he wrote a paper on conflicting ideologies. And he came home over Christmas break and gave me a folder filled with papers. And of course, the conflicting ideologies was at the back. And I was like, okay, great, honey. I see all A pluses. Yep, and you're good. and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll read these when I have some time. And, and of course, I was working full time and three kids and and um then he was like okay mom have you read those papers yet well not not quite yet but I'll get to them and by the third time he said mom have you read those papers yet and it's like a little bell went off it's like he wants me to see something in there and I come to the last paper and it was on conflicting ideologies and that's when he came out to us and you know it wasn't a surprise per se I mean he he had so many girls that were calling all the time handsome young man but he and Tyson were like night and day they were very different children and had very different um you know um just totally different personalities. Um, you wouldn't say Zach was a feminine in any way, but just for your kids. And um, so now we kind of understood why he was holding us all at a difference. So after I read that paper, I went downstairs and I just went and hugged him and I said, I don't care. Love you. Absolutely love you. And um, it took him a little longer before he wanted to share that with his dad. But, you know, it was the same thing. We we love you for who you are and you're amazing. And that's all great. However, this is where we ended up with a lot of conflicts with the with the church then because boy word got out and we're in the bible belt of alaska and it was very difficult we didn't realize the extent to which he had been bullied and had had um threats against his life you know all of that just killed me when he told me about these things and it's uh then when the word kind of got around church, I would have people that would come up to me and say, oh my gosh, you must be so disappointed. And it's like, no, you know, my son's a president scholar at PLU, you know, I'm not disappointed whatsoever. And that was a lot of the feedback that we would get were people were very negative. Mm -hmm. um, some family were very negative and that was very hurtful to us. So I think it was more hurtful of how they felt about Zach. And granted, time changed a lot of opinions. Um, but at first, it was very difficult to go through, even to the point where, you know, my parents say, oh, we're so proud of your kids. We just don't discuss them with anyone. To the point where now they're like, you know, for our memorial services, your children don't have to come because they don't want their reputation sullied. So, you know, that's where things are very painful when it comes to family. Most of the family has come around. Um, some family has been, you know what? I don't fully understand it, but I don't care. Support, uh, love, um, 
them for who they are. Um, this picture in particular, I want to point out to you, this is a creation that Rigby made in college and it he made the paper um recycled paper and then this is basically i saw it as this is our family so we've got mom dad and then we've got our three kids and i saw rigby as the one that's black and it really kind of bothered me that this is so undone um can't you finish that butterfly and his answer was no, it's done. And when I look back on that, I go, oh my gosh, I, you know, I see it is that's how you feel about your, how you felt about yourself. That was this black void. Um, I don't know what I am. I can't finish. Um, and so, uh, you know, when, when Zach came out, it was kind of a traumatic time, but things have changed. And uh, when it came around to, um, you know, we had to kind of separate ourselves because we were part of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And their philosophy was to pray the gay away. And it was into gay conversion camps, things like that. Um, they had declared in the LCMS newsletter that uh, parents of LGBTQ are um, those that support their kids, uh, that the kids themselves are abominations and that the parents who support them are abominations as well. And so I just was, you know, um, I'm a Christian, but I'm not believing what this church is because you know what? God made my kids as they are and um, he doesn't make junk. No. <laughs> you know, he doesn't, um, there's gotta be an answer for this. I've got a whole list of questions when I get to heaven, you know, what about dinosaurs? <laughs> what about, you know, uh, how, how is all this possible? And, and, um, and so it's like, I still have my Christian faith, but I'm just no longer part of that organization. Um, PLU was a great place for, uh, Zach to go to school. We ended up visiting him, um, quite a bit there. And so Rigby kind of got a feel for what PLU was like. Um, but also at that time, um, we we're getting close to wanting to move out of Alaska because it's a very hard place to be different. And so uh, we, I had the opportunity to, uh, was asked to open the new facility down at Peace Island Medical Center in um, San Juan Island. And so RJ decided to come with us and it ended up being a better place uh, for him. And of course, at that time, we thought he was more lesbian versus trans because we still really didn't have trans in our vocabulary. vocabulary. Um, again, uh, I didn't even have lesbian in my vocabulary until uh, about high school. And it was at that time, um, I was being bullied at the church. I was being bullied uh, at school again. And um, the first time I heard lesbian was I was called a lesbian at church and I was bullied for that um, saying, oh, well, you dress like a dyke. Um, and that was honestly my first introduction um, to what the gay community was. And it was through the church that it was, here's what gay people are and we hate them. Um, again, I really didn't have much knowledge. And I think for that first year of then suddenly learning what gay and lesbian meant and knowing that my church hated it and my grandparents hated it, I hated it too, because that's my family. And I saw them as we don't like this. Um, so you don't like this. And for that first freshman year of high school, um, I was, I was homophobic because it's like, I don't know what gay is, but I know we're supposed to hate it. Um, and that was hard because it was during that first year of high school that I was going, okay, so gay is when you like someone who's the same gender as you. And at that time, I was definitely very much liking girls. And I was going, I was confused as to why don't I like guys? And I thought, okay. I can't change the fact that I am a girl and so I need to date guys. It's what the church wants. It's what my family wants. And so when I started questioning why should we hate gays other than one passage in the Bible that was mistranslated, um, 
I felt confused and I went, oh my gosh, I think I am gay. And that's when I started um, dating women. And I went, oh my goodness, this is what it means to be a lesbian. It's when you love someone who's the same as you. And I still at that point had never heard the word trans. I only knew gay and lesbian as well as all the slurs for that, um, as I was called that. And so being a lesbian in Alaska was very hard. And so it was when my parents said, hey, we're moving to Washington. I felt if I go with them, I'm going to be more accepted there than if I would staying in Alaska. Oops. So definitely changing that environment. Um, we're in a, an extremely accepting place um, and a safe place for healing. And um it was interesting because both in our workplaces, um, Mark and I have become advocates. When Zach came out, um, he he really opened our eyes to a lot of things, and and yet it didn't feel you know it felt like this is really who he is, and we're just we just want him to be happy, and we love him, we're proud of him, um, and when we kind of look at our whole family unit, we didn't realize how much Tyson, as a heterosexual male, he ended up you know he had to kind of uh, take a lot of flack for being the heterosexual brother and having a, uh, a gay you know, a gay brother on one side and uh, a, a kind of in question sister on the other. And, um, and so really kind of the fi family dynamics were in upheaval a little bit. And we found out how the whole family really became affected by this. But when we came down to Washington, it was like, all right, this is a fresh start. And, you know, I can say, okay, this is, this is my son and son-in-law and here's my other son and daughter-in-law and here's my transgender son. And so we come out speaking our truth. Whereas before we'd been kind of hurt by a lot of different people that we thought maybe were friends and and all of a sudden um you know stopped associating with us because we had these different children um i had a house cleaner quit uh because she didn't want to be in a household that had a gay son um and so it was just really kind of crazy weird stuff that we went through and uh was very stressful and it was at the point where um zach was getting married yep. um that rigby and i were out to dinner having a having a conversation um zach's husband tony had uh we'd been back to colorado he graduated from the school of engineering there he is also now in the foreign service as well so they're both in mongolia together um but uh zach wedding in 2016 yeah. spring of 2016 right. rigby and i were out for uh japanese food because that's <laughs> his favorite on the island and i was like okay what are you going to wear to the wedding you know can you wear maybe some leggings and maybe a baggy top or something because we were still um you know rigby was still kind of out of it on the island you know we knew the transition was hard but he still was kind of hiding in his room he was working but he just wasn't happy and things were kind of starting to spiral a little bit for him and it was when we were out to dinner that um he let me know that you know i'm not lesbian uh that's when i came out as trans um when I had moved to the island and it was very accepting, a lot of Washington has been really wonderful and accepting. Um, I thought, okay, I can be myself. And I guess that's lesbian. Um, at that time, I still didn't really have much exposure to anything else in the LGBTQ community. Um, I was kind of curious what transgender was because I had learned about that in college and I was confused. Um, I was drawn to that and wondering what that was, but I didn't know why. I kept thinking, oh, well, uh, I had a misconception that a couple members of the LGBTQ community still have that a transgender person um, is a gay person who's ashamed, so they change their gender to be straight. And that was a misconception um, that was very hurtful, and it actually prevented me from exploring that further. And I remember being um, 
you know, I was just so depressed and I thought everything was going to be right. I had a good community. I was going to be in college. Um, I had very accepting family and neighbors, but something still wasn't right. And it took um, to a point where I was working in retail uh, and I was at a really, really low point working there because that's where I was first I, I want to say came to the realization that this is my life for the rest of my life is being treated as a woman being called a woman and it didn't feel right. And I was so confused. I was so depressed and I, I didn't know why. Um, I eventually got to a point where I told my parents, I need to go to a therapist. I need to see someone because something's not right. And I didn't know what it was. Um, and it was through therapy and counseling. Um, I, you know, had brought up a lot of issues I had with growing up and I had voiced one of the things that was in the back of my head all the time with my therapist at that time going, um, is it normal for me to constantly wish that I was a boy? Um, is it normal for me to have fantasies of what my life would have been like if I had been born a boy? And do people constantly question their gender all the time? Or is it just me? And um, she actually helped me understand, no, being transgender isn't changing for your sexuality. It's being true to who you are. Um, and actually helped me with a lot of research of understanding really what it meant to be transgender and that that is very different than uh, sexual orientation um, because gender identity is its own thing. And it was at that time uh, when we were at that restaurant, you know, I had talked to my therapist saying I need to come out to my parents. Um, and we were getting ready for the wedding. And so we were talking about clothing and my mom was probably suggesting a nice tasteful blazer or pantsuit or something. And I couldn't, I couldn't force myself to even dress as a, um, you know, a snappy lesbian woman. I told my mom, I know that's the wrong gender. And um, that's when I told her I I'm transgender. And at that point, um, she kind of had this hundred yard stare that I saw, I went, oh my gosh, she's, uh, she's accepting of gay, but maybe she's not accepting of trans because I just saw this blank and I thought, oh no. And so it was a, a very tense moment for us. Cause I'm thinking, okay, this is the one thing she can't accept. But then I later found out that she was thinking something else entirely. You were thinking. Uh, um, yeah, it was funny because, um, being a healthcare provider and, my background is um, I did 12 years in you know, intensive care and pedi pediatric ICU. And then I went to radiation oncology and, and oncology and, you know, have surgery sprinkled in there too. And um, I'm a fixer. I want to fix things. I have control. Uh, and so when he told me my mind was going, I, I had the deer in the headlights, but <laughs> yeah. um, my mind was going a million miles an hour for, okay, what do I need to do next? How do I fix this? What do we do? How do we make this work? And so I'm just thinking of all those complexities of, okay, I need to help my child. And he kind of took it as non-acceptance because I you know it was when, awkward when I'm stressed <laughs> I tend to be very quiet and where people think oh my gosh she's so <laughs> calm under pressure well my mind's doing a you know doing a lot of spins and um I was just thinking of what do, what do we do next um how do we take care of this I need to help my child because here's the answer he's finally come to and so then we kind of get into a whirlwind of change um so when uh I told my husband Mark and he's like that makes sense too. However, kind of the big thing for me, um, there was almost a post-traumatic stress that came out um, just because of how some family and some people treated us with Zach. Mm -hmm. Part of me just took a blow to the stomach um, of like, oh my gosh, we're going to have to go through all of this again. And lose friends and, and lose and, family. Um, and so part of it was, kind of that blow, but then part of it was, 
okay, let's make this happen. What do we need to do? And, you know, you were uh, an adult at the time. And so it's like, all right, um, I'm be we're behind you 100%. Let's, let's make this happen. So uh, do you want to go into kind of your whirlwind of yeah, change here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I was kind of taken aback, but it's good to have um, a nurse on your side, especially when that nurse is your mom, when navigating the medical field. So again, uh, I just want to express this isn't the norm where your parents are accepting and know the medical field and immediately you know, have questions to ask and how soon can we get you on uh, hormone replacement therapy? So I was really fortunate in that way that um, we were able to find a doctor and go to our consultation. And um, that's when I want to express my first um, really feeling comfortable with medical professionals because uh, when I was checking in at the clinic, you know, they were, what's your name? What's your preferred pronouns? Um, and they were so kind and they were so welcoming that I, I felt safe. Um, where I couldn't necessarily say I felt entirely safe before visiting um, hospitals. It was never that I felt in danger, but I felt seen. Um, that they were actually seeing and listening to me as a person and a patient. And um, when mm -hmm. I first went for my first consultation to get put on hormone replacement therapy. Um, you know, I, I had my parents with and um, the doctor was wonderful. And um, after I had stepped out of the room for something, um, she actually spoke to my parents um, to see how they were doing and, you know, express her gratitude of this is really unusual uh, to actually have parents here with a child because they're never supporting. Well, not necessarily your child, I was an adult, but supporting their child. Um, and so how did that really feel for you to have a doctor talk to you about that? She was that? really incredible. Um, we were validated as parents and, and she said, oh my gosh, you, you know, it, it's so nice to see supportive family here. And we kind of heard that throughout the transformative journey. And it just was great because not only did she care directly and listen completely to um, Rigby, but it was, it was great because she's going, oh, he's going to make such a handsome young man <laughs> and, oh, you're going to feel so good. And it just was so positive. And she took the time, uh, more than enough time. <laughs> they had, first they gave her a green card, your next appointment's ready. Then comes the flurry of yellow cards underneath the door. And then there were the red cards. You're really over and behind <laughs> schedule, but boy, did we feel so good because this is kind of a major life change. And, and she listened to us as parents as well. And this is something that doesn't affect just the, the patient, but yeah. it really affects the whole family that, that, that we found. And, and us being listened to was part of our healing process too, and part of our adjustment. Um, but then she also had provided us with uh, a book um, on where's my book. And it kind of was our Bible throughout the whole thing, because there's so many things with the, um, not so much with the hormone replacement, but when it came to surgeries, the surgeries, mm -hmm. you know, we had to have two uh, psychological or two psychologists sign off on um, prior to surgery mm -hmm. that you know, person is of sound mind and body and, and um, ready to make this decision. We had to have certain letters um, signed by doctors for petitioning for name change. And, and so it was like, it walked us through and I just kind of went step by step to kind of help. Um, Cause there's a lot of things you don't think yeah. about, you know, when it comes to, Oh gosh, I've got to change my driver's insurance. Um, Rigby had been going to school at the time at PLU. True. And so we had to change his documents um, at school. Um, we were able to change birth certificate, your social, social security. security. And so it's a lot that you're kind of going, oh yeah. I it's not a quick it. or sudden change. It definitely takes a lot of time. Um, even with the uh, paperwork, you need the two doctors to, or two psychologists to sign off, but it also has to get those, you have to prove that you've been in counseling for two to three years, that this isn't you suddenly seeing something on the internet and going, yeah, I want to be transgender tomorrow and suddenly getting all this. No, it was a lot of paperwork. It was going to a lot of medical professionals and saying, 
this isn't a phase. This isn't something I saw on the internet and wanted to try for fun. It was, no, this is a medical diagnosis and a lot of paperwork. Um, Uh, One of the changes that, uh, so here's the, where's my book, Guide for Transgender. It has basically everything you ever want to know. It's wonderful for um, other family members to kind of understand. It's got about every topic there, Um, but it was just extremely helpful to us because we didn't have anyone to talk to. We didn't have any resources to go from. And so this became so helpful for us. Um, And then with the surgeries, uh, part of it was a little bit of education when it came to at least the hysterectomy. Here we're um, trying to get all of this taken care of during winter break and January interim. And, Initially, when we talked to the gynecologist at uh, Virginia Mason, she was like, oh, well, we can just do both surgeries at the same time, and I'll just have a breast surgeon come in and do a mastectomy. And I was like, yeah, no, I, I, I just don't feel comfortable doing both of those at the same time. Let's do the hysterectomy first, and then let me research um, surgeons who specialize in uh male reconstruction or who specialize in transgender patients because I want to have a nice looking chest for him. And I'd rather have two procedures than, than just one. Yeah. And um, do you want to talk about your experience at uh, Virginia Mason? Yeah. Um, both experiences at the hospital were very wonderful. I think only at one time at Virginia Mason, um, I had been misgendered, um, which it, it is uh, definitely confusing when you have someone walk in with a beard and breasts and say, I'm here for um, a hysterectomy. Uh, and um, I was able to get the hysterectomy. Again, this wasn't necessarily tied to necessarily transgender surgery, but because my polycystic um, ovarian syndrome had gotten so bad and increasing testosterone actually exacerbated it and made it worse. And so I needed the hysterectomy, but also then I wouldn't have to take so much testosterone to suppress the estrogen that my body was making. Um, With the top surgery um, that was removing the breasts, oh, the doctor was wonderful. Um, He, you know, was explaining the whole thing. Everyone was super nice and welcoming and uh we're using the correct pronouns of oh yeah it's it's awkward to be a man with breasts we'll fix that up for you um and so i I actually had a really wonderful experience um at both which is odd to say of i I was getting major surgery but the experience was wonderful (laughs) well and then of course having the mom nurse advocate here um initially they wanted to send him home right after the hysterectomy and they were having a hard time with pain control. And, oh, and yeah. I insisted that he stay the night and they get, um, get him taken care of as for pain control. And then we took him home the next day. Um, so part of that was being great patient, you know, yeah. nurse advocate, <laughs> I'm doing my stuff. Um, top surgery was fantastic. We were able to take him home. Uh, that afternoon, uh, we stayed in Seattle just to monitor for bleeding, but let me tell you, Rigby was so funny. Um, he just, we'd get back to the hotel and he's like, I want a steak. <laughs> and uh, the whole time home, you know, since they're doing pretty complex and they're, they're trimming down nipples and they're regrafting in there. And here I went from this daughter who was hiding away, who I could never see uh, naked or in any varying state of undress to Rigby would rip off his shirt and go nip check. <laughs> and he, he has to check just, the drains and the nip grass. So happy with this load off his chest. It was literally. And literally <laughs> we went from always hiding in the room and the blinds closed to he never shuts the blinds now. And all of a sudden it's like this whole personality opened up. And so I went from this shy hiding little girl, unhappy little girl to now I have a loud boisterous male. And I think it was right in between the surgeries that you had your name change, That's that right, you had yeah. your port appearance for name change. And and that was wonderful, um, which again is such an odd thing to say, because with a name change, you have to petition to change your name and go in front of a court. You have to go in front of a judge and 
etc and it, you know defend why you want to change your name and um i could see how that would be terrifying in a big city because there's going to be a lot more people than the tiny island i was on but um after i you know i got the name change uh i believe the judge actually st stepped down from his podium and gave me a hug um and as well as the other people in the room you know wishing me the best of luck and then even uh, exiting to get my uh, paperwork because I needed that paperwork to change social security and driver's license. Um, they were so helpful and kind there going, oh, congratulations, and we're so happy for you, and you're going to need extra copies, we'll make you seven. <laughs> um, and it was, it was wonderful to be around such helpful and accepting people. It was really uh, a big healing experience for me, ultimately, because I, for the first time, you know, in the mirror was saying, oh my gosh, I can actually see me and this, and now other people can see me for how I felt, you know, um, that I am. And it was, it was a wonderful experience. Well, and as we were getting you back to the first spring semester then, oh, yeah, uh, it was so funny because right. we're at the store and it's Girl Scout cookie time. <laughs> and um, we went to stock Go up on cookies. some Girl Scout cookies. And the lady who was with a young girl who was selling the cookies, uh, they had a dog there and the dog just started barking at Rigby. And the lady was like, oh, our dog hates men. <laughs> and Rigby just smiled and was so happy yeah. to be called a man. And, and that this dog was clearly you're a man and I hate you. And so it was gender <laughs> affirming to have. Um... <laughs> yeah. So, it, it, you know, it was so joyous to me. And. And then uh, Rigby, of course, started back into spring semester, which I have to say, I am just amazed at the courage that it took for him to start school and transition through school. I would hide personally until I had everything done. And then I'd go, hey, hi, I'm so and so. But he did it in front of everyone. He came back the next semester and was welcomed and um, just had a fantastic yeah. school year. Um, it was, I had started my first semester under my previous name, which was Shelby and identifying as female, but trans. And what was really welcoming at PLU is they have a, um, it's like a gender diversity wing, I want to say. And it was, hey, this is a wing for people who are transgender or um, non-binary, gender non-conforming. And so I was already in a little dorm wing that was with other people like myself. And, um, you know, they immediately, what's your name? What's your pronouns? Um, but it was, it was very interesting to attend classes first, that first semester as Shelby, and then come back for second semester and be Rigby. Um, I actually had a class uh, right before uh, my big surgery, which was one of the professors talking about, hey, here's how we work with transgender students. You may have little Johnny disappear during the winter and come back as uh, Janie. And how do we address that? And I go, oh, I'm doing that. But the other way around. Um, and so it was wonderful that even the school addresses, um, you know, how do we support transgender students and youth? And, um, you know, for the most part, everyone was like, wow, you look so much happier and I love your beard now. Um, I only think I had a couple people that were, oh, I don't know who this guy is, but he is really fun. <laughs> so, it, no, PLU was really supporting. I had wonderful professors who were checking in to see how I was doing um, and making sure that I felt safe and comfortable where I was, which I don't think I could get at another school, which... And he graduated yeah. magna cum laude, so... <laughs> very proud of him but um after all these experiences you know he's happy he's healthy he's doing great he's in a good spot but it's like when he went back to school the wind went out of my sails because here I was busy okay I'm researching hospitals I'm researching surgeons I'm researching all of this stuff and then all of a sudden he's gone he's happy and I kind of went down into a great grace area, not that I was, you know, there's a grieving process that the family goes through and I didn't really realize how much, you know, when I would look at family pictures on the wall, it's like, I had to ask Rigby, I said, can I still have these up? Because, um, you know, 
this is my child as the child. And, and so how do I, how do I feel about that, but respect his wishes as well? And how do I refer? So it took a little bit of adjustment in that realm. And part of me was also, I think, so fearful for his safety, because that's where, um, you know, in different parts of the world, when Zach goes, you know, I worry about his safety. So far, he's been in pretty good places. But, you know, there's always that niggling fear in the back of your mind that there are people that hate um, a couple of who my children are. And um, so there, I think I was holding on way too tight. I, I was like, Rigby, you have to call me every <laughs> evening before you go to bed because I just need to make sure you're safe. And I was trying to figure out, you know, I probably, I should have talked to a counselor. I should have gone to a counselor. But what I did instead, was <laughs> I, I, um, Rigby and I were, Rigby was home one weekend and we were yeah. at the Saturday market and people were asking for homes for foreign exchange students. And so we got to talking about that because we had done some various foreign exchange when we were up in Alaska for just short periods of time. And uh, they said, no, this is for a whole school year and you get to pick your student. Mm -hmm. And, and so I said, okay, I want a girl. Um, I'll, I'll do this. So I came home and my husband was like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm getting a 15 year old girl from France who's a ballerina. And, um, um, and Mark was worried that, okay, what is Rigby going to feel? Does he feel like you're going to replace, trying to replace his daughter? And I was like, no, I just want to get a girl experience that I never had growing up or never had with Rigby yeah. growing up. And so it ended up, um, we had Capucine for, for a year and I went to so many ballets, did so many things and just had so much joy from this experience of having this daughter and it wasn't to replace because all of a you sudden now <laughs> I, yeah, because I never had one. Um, but here I have this joyous, loud, another <laughs> joyous, loud son. And, <laughs> um, and so I kind of got my girl time and she was so healing because now that I was concerned about a 15 year old girl, <laughs> I released my death grip on Rigby. So he was able to, not have his mom holding on so tight. And I was able to experience this with Capucine. And, you know, this was years ago and she's still part of our family and we've gone back and forth and back and forth. And, and um, in speaking to her about our family, initially when I talked to her dad, um, prior to her arriving on the island, um, you know, I, I had said, well, you know, we'll probably take Capucine down to Panama to visit my son and son-in-law. So he, they knew we had a gay son and, and he was like, great, that's wonderful, you know? And so I thought, okay, good. They're fine with that. But I was very hesitant about bringing up a transgender son too. And so that, you know, it was part of my PTSD for, oh, how much can I reveal? Sure. Mm -hmm. And um, so when Capucine came, she knew, okay, we're going to Panama. We're going to visit Zach and Tony. And, and uh, I'm trying to explain the family pictures because we went the next week to do some school shopping. And I said, you're probably wondering in the family pictures, you know, who that little girl is. And, and she said, oh, I figured it out. That's Rigby. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. And then she blurts out, well, um, I'm, I'm bisexual myself, but I haven't told my parents. And it's like, oh no, you're going <laughs> to tell your parents. And they'll, uh, we were just kind of going, oh, really? It's not just our household that, that, um, uh, yeah, is turning all these kids different sexualities. Yeah. But, um, it was funny because then when she went home, she told her parents on the way home from the airport <laughs> that, oh, and by the way, I'm bisexual and just wanted you to know, since, you know, I had so much honesty with, which we yeah, ended up with a close, week. Yeah, yeah. A close relationship and her family is our family. And, and, uh, we've been able to openly discuss everything and it's just been, um, absolutely fantastic 
experience. And, and now, you know, I tell people that, okay, I'm speaking at PLU and it's on transgender and here I have a transgender son or here I have a homosexual son or here I also have, um, uh, a journalist, you know, a journalist. No. <laughs> and I can tell you about that. Um, so it's been wonderful to be able to share our truth. Um, and it's helped um, other people in our community as well, because uh, my mom's very open as an advocate. Um, and because the island is so accepting that other people have actually come to my mom for advice of my, hey, child my is son transsexual. might be gay or my child might be trans. What what do I do? What, you know, yeah, with just all these to be questions. a support, yeah. you know, and, and that's definitely one more a thing Mark, my husband, has advocated for because, you know, there's that macho machismo in the cockpit. And occasionally his co pilot would be, oh, you know, making some disparaging remark about someone or a flight attendant or something. And Mark would always go, stop right there. Let me tell you about my family. And to the point where, you know, he was a leader as far as a training instructor and a leader as far as a uh, captain in the Arctic area. And uh, people started coming to him and going, oh, my child just came out as gay and it's fine with me, but my wife is having a really hard time with this. Can she speak to your wife? And so we've kind of fallen into this role then as advocate. And um so that's what we're trying to do. Here is a picture of Capucine and then kind of some older pictures of these are my four kids now. So we have um, Zach in the top left there, Tyson on the right, Rigby down below and Capucine. Um, she's coming out again this summer to visit with us. And it's funny, her parents call us uh, her, her, you, Amer her American parents. So we still speak to her every other week and, um, we're very big in her life. She's very big in our life. Our kids love her to pieces. She loves her older brothers, yeah. all of her older brothers. Um, and so it's been, uh, a terrific experience having that. So as we get into advocacy, you know, we've yeah. been members of PFLAG at Peace Health. We have a caregiver affinity group and mm -hmm. it's actually a very large group and it's all LGBTQ, um, I'm all minorities and it's a very active group within our organization and I'm just so pleased as a Catholic health institution that we are so open to everyone mm -hmm. and uh, it's been kind of my goal to make some changes within the medical practice and I have had a chance to do that. Um, initially when we moved here I was on the nursing student board and then we were asked to serve on the diversity board as well and it was my goal to blend the two so that at some point we could talk about our um you know, underserved patient population, or why are they not served? Why mm -hmm. are they uncomfortable for coming in for healthcare? And how can we change this? How can we change the nursing curriculum to encompass more, more of our population, yeah. and especially this underserved group, and why they feel um, scared to come in and scared to be uh, seen by a physician, or what um, you know, are some of the things that they've experienced that keep them from healthcare to mm -hmm. hopefully give them some empathy so that they are maybe a little better prepared. And, you know, I've used that. We've got, um, I had a surgeon the other day, um, we had a, a, a woman having hernia repair and the surgeon was, oh, hey, you know, we'll get you in right away, sir. And I flagged him and brought him, uh, brought the surgeon over and I said, please use female pronouns. And he's going, oh, shoot, thank you for reminding me. And it's like, okay, that's all right. You made a mistake. Patient knows you made a mistake. Just change it and let's and go on, on with it. And so he was like, thank you so much for calling me out on this. And so it's just trying to do that um, uh, gender affirming yeah. care. Um, I try to put up little signs everywhere, <laughs> how everyone is welcome here. Um, so I'm kind of, um, you know, the, the uh, I, I know when right after Rigby um, had his surgeries. Oh, that's right. He yeah. had to go in um, for just a checkup. Yearly checkup. And of course me, I'm one of the founding members <laughs> of the hospital there. And I was running around because I didn't want anyone to be uncomfortable. And I didn't want Rigby to be uncomfortable. And I apologize for being a helicopter parent, <laughs> but I was like, I don't want the front desk to feel like, oh my gosh, we don't want to be Who caught with our jaws open. <laughs> so I just was like, 
Rigby had some surgery over the holidays. And so now Shelby's Rigby and just wanted to let you know. So you didn't, you know, weren't shocked. And I went back to his healthcare provider and uh, their nurse and went, just to let you know, <laughs> this is, this is what's going on. And, and I had already checked with our provider and she was well aware and has always been respectful of, uh, of what you were going through. But um, I was just kind of greasing the wheels so that when he came back from, I didn't go to the appointment with him, <laughs> but when he came back from the appointment, he it's was going, wonderful. it was great. Everybody knew who I was. Yeah. And, and the lab manager came out, gave him a big hug and, and was just so proud of him for for what he had gone through and shining an example here in the community and and then Rigby belongs to a number of different uh human rights campaign yeah. and uh quite a few different things and so this is kind of our contribution trying to give back so that we can help others and not be uncomfortable or at least yeah. have someone to talk to because um if we can make, make it a little easier yeah, yeah. Um, because I know uh, with a couple of my friends who are also uh, transgender, um, it is it is scary going to um, a doctor's office pre-transition and feeling uncomfortable of, OK, sir, what do you need when they are a trans woman? And um, I know for one of my friends, that's one of her biggest fears is you know, what if I get weird looks or what if a doctor refuses to uh, serve me because I'm transgender um, and how can I get them, you know, ask for X, Y, and Z. And so just helping, um, I think through these speaking events and as well as my mom helping with the curriculum, I think will help ease a lot of that tension and make it easier for uh, trans people and non-binary uh, to access healthcare without the fear of being judged or mislabeled. Um, and so it's, it's good to be helping with that. Do you want to start on this one? Oh, just what, you know, one of the things that when we look at LGBTQIA, um, it's a huge spectrum of people and um just because they're all lumped together doesn't mean they all get along and and take for example when rigby came out to his brother and brother-in-law it was funny because zach was like okay i've had some transgender friends and know all about this well my son-in-law was so great he was going well and and he's you know was the Bella, the school of engineering valedictorian at university of colorado and he's they're both super smart and and um he was like rigby i don't know anyone who's transgender but i will study up on this and i will be an advocate and i will be a support for you and so uh and tyson my journalist um he just kind of rolled with it and like, yeah, whatever. It's <laughs> just the funny thing is when he first saw Rigby as Rigby. I look uh, like a of, tiny version of him. He looks like tiny Tyson. <laughs> and uh, he just laughed and laughed because everybody we went, like oh, twins. this is your brother. <laughs> um, so it was pretty darn funny. But still, there's a lot of um, a lot of people within that group don't understand transgender or there may be prejudices against transgender. And so it's not just one big happy family under the rainbow. It's just like, you know, when you look at um, uh, different minorities, depending on the shade of your skin, there may be um, disparities between your skin isn't dark enough or your skin isn't light enough. And um, we see that in LGBTQ as well. It's not fully, you know, as you've experienced, it, there's not a complete understanding just because you're all lumped together in the alphabet soup. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, with sharing my experience, um, when I was part of uh, the Gay Straight Alliance, that's what introduced me to my first misconception of what transgender was, is they framed it. And granted, that was just one school group. It's not representative of everyone, but it was them saying, well, transgender is when you're ashamed of being gay, so you change your gender to be straight. Or another one I heard, um, not at PLU, but at another college I attended, they had said, oh, well, transgender is when men want to sleep with lesbians, so they pretend to be a woman. And it was hurtful to learn that from the community that I'm part of and is supposed to be accepting me. Um, and you may have even seen or heard a lot of the movements right now, even within the LGTB community, is they're calling it the LGB and they're dropping the T because they feel, oh, well, transgender people aren't really gay and no, we're not gay. It's a 
gender identity, not a sexual orientation, but it's hurtful to even be discriminated against in your own group. Um, which brings up another thing, which is TERFs who uh, label themselves as uh, trans exclusionary radical feminists. Um, and it's, you know, JK Rowling proudly announces herself as a TERF as someone who says, well, trans women aren't women and actively fights against the rights of trans people. And it's really hurtful to see that in someone in a group that says, hey, we're here to support um, minorities and women and then purposely exclude uh, trans women or women of color um, because it doesn't fit their idea of feminism. And so that's so hurtful to the trans community. Um, and another thing that's uh, hurtful oftentimes when um, you're dating, which is uh, hard enough when you're gay and then it's also hard when you're trans because a lot of transgender people are called traps in the gay community um, because we're a trap. We're trying to trick you into having sex with us. That's not it at all. Um, but it's so hurtful to be called that when you go on a dating site and they say, oh, well, you're a girl and not really a man. And I don't want to date, you know, a, a woman because I'm gay or the same with trans women and um, people saying, oh, well, I don't I don't want to date a man. I want to date a woman. And so it, it's so hurtful to hear those things. Um, like we already have discrimination in the whole wide world, but then to see it in your community is just a little extra hurtful. And that's not to say that it's the whole community, but there is a minority that makes you not feel safe in um, LGBTQ spaces. Love the same, because it does take a lot of courage um, to grow up and become who you really are. And, and I really admire um, both Zach and, Tyson and Rigby for becoming who they really are. And our family has become so much closer um, just in that we're all in this together. Um, the walls have been knocked down, the barriers are no longer there. And um, those relationships have really had a great healing effect. Us being able to speak about this has provided healing for us as well. And we hope it provides healing for those of us uh, or for others who are, are hearing from us. And um, as I've got this sign in our house, in this house, we believe Black Lives Matter. Feminism is for everyone. Humans are not illegal. Science is real. Love is love. Healthcare is a human right. And kindness is everything. And that's where the biggest thing is that, um, you know, my my kids have a career that they're passionate about. Um, we've been given a lot, so we should give a lot. I want them to be happy and just find someone to love. I don't care who it is, um, as long as they're um, making kind my and, kind, yeah. yeah, making my child happy and kind, and that they um, help each other to grow. Um, we just really appreciate. Um, your presence here today and listening to us. And I know it was during your lunchtime and I hope you were able to get something, but I uh, just wanna open this up to um, some questions. Um, and we really appreciate that you're here. We're kind of like that little pebble in the water and we know it's just one little stone, but we hope it ripples out and um, can make some positive changes in lives. Don and Rigby, thank you so much. Uh, your story was incredibly healing for me. Um, it's so important for me to talk and listen Thank to you. transgender adult, adults to know that we can have a future that is fulfilling and full of love. Now, we are open mm -hmm. for questions. Um, please submit them via the Q&A function. And while these questions come in, uh, I have a question for myself. Um, either of you can answer this. What is something what do you wish you would have known before starting this journey? Oh, I wish I knew what trans was early on <laughs> that I had to, I, I feel like so much could have prevented, you know, a lot of the troubles and tribulations I went through, um, having known about it earlier, um, and t you know, I know a lot of other people in the trans community, sometimes they don't come out till they're 50 or 60 when they finally learn about it. So I guess in a way I am fortunate um, they that, were pretty young that I was in my twenties when um, I was able to learn more and be educated. 
Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy. And I guess that's why I was so quick to, okay, now that we have an answer, how do we get there? You know, mm-hmm. let's get on to the other side of this. And, and yes, there was a lot of stress at the time, but, and that's what I tell people who come to me today is, you know what, you're going to get to the other side of this and the other side of this is really good. And, you know, it's not without it's, um, you know, life for everyone can be difficult. Mm-hmm. So it's not just, okay, because you're trans, it's extra difficult. It's like, once you get to this side, you're going to have ups and downs just like everybody else, but um, at least you are who you are now and you're true to that. And, um, you know, we're able to give him the starting point of where, okay, this, this new life starts and mm-hmm. you've got a great foundation and just go. And uh, we're always the safety net at home. (laughs) That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I have, uh, I have another question. Mm -hmm. What is, um, what is something you are looking forward to with your, with your advocacy and work with the community? Well, I mean, you've got a lot of advocacy with the hospital and helping. Yeah, um, I'm, I've been able to make some good changes there. Um, Like the um, Peace Health Questionnaire. Yeah, initially we had a a patient identifier uh, that our patient access reps were asking patients, and what does it say on your birth certificate? certificate? Are you male or female? And actually, uh, someone within the community who is LGBTQ called me and said, I find this horrifically offensive, and I can't believe they're using that as a patient identifier. So I went to our CEO, and I said, hey, (laughs) um, guess what? I had some of the public call me about this, and within a week, it changed she was able to put the wheels in motion and it was completely eliminated from peace health uh, patient identifiers because that was offensive to LGBTQ community. So, um, you know, you just have to speak up. And as I've gotten older and I'm farther in my career, <laughs> I, I speak up a lot more. <laughs> and, and so that's kind of been great. And we just kind of hope to spread the word and maybe get some invitations to, to speak in other places. And, and, you know, anytime we're talking to anyone, it's, it's an opportunity to enlighten and provide extra knowledge so people have better understanding. Thank you, Don. I we have a question from um, Jody Erickson. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story, Don and Rigby. Here is my question: Do you ever feel anger towards those who are not accepting of your family? And if so, how do you deal with that? You know, we've kind of learned to let some things go because there can be toxic people in your life, and even though they, you know, thankfully there aren't a lot, but you kind of put those people by the wayside. If they don't accept you, you know, that's their loss and it's just kind of too bad. Sometimes it's very difficult um, when it's, um, you know, when family, I mean, when we've seen um, my father-in-law, it had a very hard time with Zach's coming out and felt on his graduation day that he needed to give him a letter that expressed his disappointment in his life's choices. And it just uh, devastated devastated Zach. Zach. And was so hurtful. And my husband, who has the patience of a saint, I've never seen him so angry in my life. And he thoughtfully wrote a very long letter to his father saying, uh, you know, who would choose this? This is not a choice. Um, and, uh, but then I was so proud of my father-in-law because he cha- he's 93 years old. And when we told them about Rigby transitioning, they were so, you know, they, they may were, not understand mm-hmm. it, but they had Rigby over, you know, every, every, every other weekend for dinner to talk to him and, and to, um, you know, and, and, now my father-in-law has a very different relationship with his grandchildren versus my parents. I've just had to kind of say their behavior is toxic. And I, um, you know, unfortunately they see things very differently and I just have to um, cut that out because it's toxic to us. 
Um, and what I really appreciated, uh, kind of circling back to the question of what do you do with family that aren't accepting is we are very open and vulnerable because we came to our family and friends and said, hey, I'm transgender. And while uh, we were really hard broken um, when my grandpa on my dad's side had rejected my brother he did he did care about us and he was willing to change because mm -hmm. it, it took some time and so what I appreciate with him is you know when we were having dinner one time he goes you know I'm not sure what transgender is but I'm gonna buy a book and learn about it and so it's um, both knowing when a relationship um, you know people can change and they absolutely can turn around and then knowing which ones aren't going to change and aren't necessarily help uh, healthy but I'm, I'm just happy to see um, even with people who aren't accepting at first there's always a chance for them to change and become supportive. Thank you. Uh, Tamara Williams um, submitted a question. Rigby, how do you see taking your advocacy forward as an art teacher? Oh, well, what I'm most excited about um, and what I used in special education was using art as a means to uh, learn social skills and express those. And so I'm very excited um, as an art teacher to then implement that with social skills and advocacy because um, I don't necessarily want to push a message, but I really want to advocate for my students and their self-expression and let them know that this is a safe space. Um, and what's, you know, a safer space than art to express yourself and just helping, you know, students build that empathy and going, you're not alone. And, um, you know, you can really be who you are. And so I'm just excited for art and helping my students advocate for themselves. Uh, I remember several of my art teachers being some of my strongest supporters, so I, I appreciate that work. Thank you so much. Um, it, let me see. I'm going to wait for uh, if there are any more questions. Um, Don and Rigby, on behalf of uh, PLU, thank you so much for your presentation. The next talk is Healing in the Professions with professors from the School of Nursing and the School of Business. And um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Oh, thank you. Thank you, you too. You too. Thank you so much. Thank you.